We're now going to take a look at what is almost certainly the most important area of the syllabus. It is a very big chunk of the syllabus. The good news is that the vast majority of it you've already seen on paper F8 and virtually every technique for the exam you've already done. There is some additional knowledge, don't get me wrong, but a large amount of this is the central core of that F8 paper, so you should recognise quite a bit of it. The other reason why it's such a main part of the course is that there are two major exam areas in this section. So let me explain what the section is, break it down a bit, and we can take a look. This section of the syllabus is the external audit process. So here we have the external audit process, checking a company's annual financial statements. We start off by planning, and as I hope you remember from paper F8, that will involve things like assessing materiality, assessing audit risk, using analytical procedures, etc. So the good news is that the planning stage is just as it was on F8. So why put it on this exam then? How is this advanced audit? Well, on this paper, the reason it's harder is that materiality issues could be slightly more complicated. But the main issue is audit risk. Audit risk is basically about identifying why the audit might go wrong, especially why there might be mistakes that are material in the financial statements that we might not spot. Well, mistakes in the financial statements could be virtually anything. On paper F8, it tends to be fairly basic accounting issues, whereas on this exam, it could be virtually anything, and that's what makes it harder. The audit technique is the same, the accounting issues are tougher. We then assess internal controls to see if we can rely on them to protect the accuracy of the company's accounts. This is not a major area for this particular exam. It's quite detailed and it's really covered by the F8 syllabus. So remember it's there, but it's not that critical. The really big issue, though, is what's coming up next. Because once you've assessed controls, you know how much substantive testing you can do. Substantive testing is a big area of the F8 syllabus. You're constantly asked, what audit tests would you do to check this? And the same is true here. As with the risk area of this part of the syllabus, the techniques are the same. We will still test using analytical procedures, inquiry inspection, etc. We'll still be looking for documents, obtaining management representations, third-party confirmations, and stuff like that. All of that is stuff you know already. 
The problem is now that instead of checking that the depreciation is right, that bad debts are right, stuff like that, that assets exist, here you may have to deal with harder accounting areas like intangible assets, deferred tax, investment properties, leases, and all sorts of other things. Same techniques, harder financial reporting. A common theme on this exam. You should, of course, remember how this part of the audit process works. We assess controls. If they look good, we'll test them just to make sure they are actually happening. A lot of things look good on paper until you realise that no one's actually following it. And if the control tests suggest that the controls are happening properly, we can reduce the amount of substantive testing that we do. If, on the other hand, the controls aren't working, or when we assess them, we don't really care if they work because they wouldn't achieve anything anyway, then we're going down the other side of the diagram and full substantive testing will need to be done. So bigger sample sizes, a lot more checking. And once you've done the substantive tests that you feel are appropriate to get the level of evidence you need to be assured that the financial statements are accurate, there's some completion stuff we would do. Assessing going concern, for example, and looking at subsequent events. And then we can sign the audit report at the end. Now, everything I've put up on the screen there, apart from the fact that more complicated financial reporting could be involved, everything up on the screen there is paper F8. There's nothing new. So as we go through this part of the syllabus, we are not going to just repeat stuff you should already know. We're instead going to take it a bit further, and especially with risk and substantive testing, practice using our techniques on harder accountancy areas. As long as you practice doing that, because this is a very practical part of the syllabus, technically, nothing in here should scare you. Being the audit process, it is quite a big chunk of the syllabus, so this will take us a little time to get through. And in fact, the syllabus separates our audit reports, which often have their own question as well. So what we had up on the screen there could be three questions on the exam. Risk, substantive testing, and an audit report question. So this is a very important part of the syllabus. However, before we go back through the audit process and try some harder, advanced auditing questions, there is actually one stage we need to look at that you may not have considered yet. On F8, you're basically told this is how we audit. But on P7, we can relax things a little. As long as we work within the auditing standards, there might be some very efficient things we can do that will make the audit more profitable. And don't forget, we're a commercial organisation. We need to make profits. So if we can see some strategic choices that could allow us to make the audit more efficient and therefore more profitable, we should do it. So we're going to start by looking at some audit strategy issues. Once we've done those, we'll move on into the planning stage of the audit and look at risk, materiality, etc. But first... Audit strategy. When you are first taught auditing, one of the first things you're told is that auditors take a risk-based approach. We don't just do the same audit that we did at the last client and the last client. We try to tailor the process to each individual client based on the risks that we perceive. On F8, you're told all about the audit risk model. However, in reality, the audit risk model has changed over recent years. It's still the audit risk model, you know, inherent risk, control risk, and all that. It's all still there. But there has been a bit of a shift of focus, and we'll need to look at that a little later on. But... Apart from how we assess risk, there are some other strategic issues as well. Starting with one you should be relatively familiar with, except maybe you've not considered the whole story just yet. And that is, should we rely on controls or do a full, detailed, substantive audit?
Well, of course, we know from paper F8 and from the diagram I put up on the screen, if the controls aren't good enough, you can't rely on them. You'll have to check all the numbers and disclosures yourself directly. In other words, full substantive testing. However, if the controls are good, you've actually got a choice. Just because they're good, you don't have to rely on them. And don't forget, just because the controls look good, you can't rely on them until you've carried out control tests to prove they actually happen. And that takes time. Maybe in some situations it would simply be quicker to just check the numbers yourself. Forget about the company's controls. For example, imagine you have a building and within the building there is one door. The company is very keen that that door is always kept locked when the last person goes home at night. Understandably so. So they have a process, some controls, to make sure that happens. There is a security guard who has a key. There is a second security guard who checks during the evening that the building is still secure and comes in and checks that the door is still locked. Every morning, the first person into the building is required to report whether the door is locked or not in a special sheet, on a form, and that's kept in a file. They're pretty keen to make sure this door is locked, aren't they? So imagine your job is to check, is that door locked? What you could do is full substantive testing. There's one door, go and check and see if it's locked. Or you could test all those controls I've just described. Go and have a look in the file to see if every day someone does check that that door is locked and does report it. Observe the security guard at night checking the door. Make sure the second security guard is checking it as well. And if all of that is working, fabulous. You can now reduce your sample size from checking one door to checking one door. If there's only one door, you can't do any less than checking one door. Why don't you just go and check the door yourself? That must be quicker than checking the controls and then checking the door anyway. What if there were two doors? Well, as long as the two doors are fairly close together, I'm thinking it's still quicker to check two doors and have checked everything than it is to check the controls. How many doors would there need to be before you'd start thinking, I don't want to check all these doors? Maybe if there were a hundred doors, you could check the controls, make sure they happen, watch the security guards, and then go and just check two or three doors yourself. But unless you've got a lot of doors, what's the point in checking the controls? If there aren't that many transactions in the company, check them yourself. You can probably check all of them and not even bother with samples. So there we go, potentially a strategic choice to be made. If you're auditing a company with very small transactions, but there are trillions of them, well, what would you rather check? Trillions of little transactions or the one system they all fly through? I'm checking the system. If the system works, all those transactions probably work. If, on the other hand, you have a client that has a very small number of very big transactions, it's probably quicker just to check them yourself. Substantive. So there we go. 
in companies that have a small quantity of transactions, it may actually be quicker, even if they have excellent controls, to just go and check them yourself. Substantive testing. However, most big worldwide companies, Tesco's, British Airways, companies like that, do of course sell millions of individual transactions, if not billions in some cases. And in situations like that, it's almost certainly quicker to take a controls approach.